Hello and welcome to 5-Minute Bible Study. I'm going to talk about uh, Genesis, starting in Genesis 2, 18, I believe it goes to 25 today. So I'm going to read uh, 18 to 20. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam called, gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found that help meat for him. The word meat means worthy or useful in this context. Here, it does not mean to run into someone by accident or design, nor is there such a word in the Bible as help meat. A help is a person who helps. The following verses reveal one way the Bible defines itself, that is by word substitution. Notice, uh, notice I'm going to emphasize two words. In Matthew 3, 8, it says, bring therefore fruits, bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. In Luke 3, 8, it says, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance. So by word substitution, you can see that meet and worthy are the same thing. The power to name, and this is one way the Bible does it translate itself is, and only the King James Bible does this, modern Bibles do not. So if you have a modern Bible, you don't have a sword of the Lord, you have a butter knife. The power to name represents the power to have dominion over just, over, over, has the power to have dominion over, just as the power to tax represents the power to govern. God gives Adam the power to name, not just to label, but recognition of what the beast is in relation to man. God, therefore, defines animals in the Bible in reference to their relation to agricultural man and military man, as in beasts of the forest and beasts of the field, and function, as in fowl flying, which includes a bat in Leviticus 11, or a fish swimming in the sea, which includes a whale, comparing Jonah 1.17 and Matthew 12.40. Modern taxonomic classifications having to do with species, family, order, etc., are post-Bible terms that man uses to categorize animals in certain ways that are different from the Bible's categories. In the Bible, as in modern day reality, a beast of the forest is not going to pull your plow as a matter of rule. Here's a reference by God himself to what we would call a rhinoceros today, which had a much larger range of existence in early days as shown by the Lascaux cave paintings in France. In Job 39, nine through 12, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Wilt thou trust him because his strength is great? Or wilt thou leave thy labor to him? Wilt thou believe him that he will bring home thy seed and gather it into thy barn? Although Adam did give names to everything, there was not found one creature that was useful or worthy to be his co-administrator over God's creation as the stewards of God's earth. Genesis 2, 21 to 25. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The creator made the human female from the bone of a male. Woman is the only creature not direct, made directly from the ground. She was made from material already present in the man. Today, we have the advantage of understanding our, very, our own very imperfect process of cloning one individual for another. What is truly important about this passage is the fact that this is the pattern for marriage before God. The union of a man and a woman as one flesh, this union being the consummation of the marriage. There are a great many sermons to be had in this passage, but I will try to avoid sermonizing so, so, so as not to take away from what the text literally says. Suffice it to say that many days of sorrow could have been avoided in a young man or woman's life if a young man or a young woman had been capable of leaving the control of their mother and father to start a new life together. In their original state of innocence, the man and the woman had no sense of shame for their nakedness. There were no inhibitions for them in that regard. And I'll stop there today and we'll take it up next time with the most disastrous event in human history. All right. Thank you and take care.